together uh, to study your word and we pray, uh, Father, that at this time of the year you uh, especially prepare our hearts and minds for the upcoming feast days and we pray that your spirit lead us as we study your psalms. As we pray as your humble servants, amen. <clears throat> okay, am I up a little bit too loud? Yeah, a little bit. Okay, you, she 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 does it on the fly. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> okay, we're on Psalm fifty-six, verse one says, "Be gracious to me, O Elohim, for man has trampled upon me, fighting all day long. He oppresses me." Now this this psalm is called a mictum. And Psalm 16 was a mictum also. And the meaning of mictum is kind of uncertain. It possibly means covering since it's a heading on, on psalms that have the context of prayer motivated by danger. So that may be what it, what it means. Now the setting for this psalm is that, uh, that one time when David had to fake insanity. Now Psalm 34 was about that also. And that's what this psalm is about, too. He had to fake insanity in front of the king, uh, King Achish of, of Gath, of Gath, yeah. And that's in 1 Samuel 21, starting at verse 10. We read, Then David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. But the servants of Achish said to him, Is this not David, the king of the land? Did they not sing of this one as they danced, saying, Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. And David took these words to heart and greatly feared Achish, king of Gath. So he disguised his sanity before them and acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Behold, you see the man behaving as a madman. Why do you bring him to me? Do I lack madmen that you brought this one to me to act the madman in my, mad in my presence? Shall this one come into my house? So it worked. Okay, so when all else fails and there's no way out, act like a madman. So, so I guess that's what we learn here. So it's, okay to be crazy. it's okay to be crazy. Yeah. Sometimes crazier than others. Now with that being the case, continuing the psalm here, verse 2. My foes have trampled upon me all day long. For there are many who fight proudly against me. When I'm afraid, I'll put my trust in you. In Elohim, whose word I praise, in Elohim I have put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can mere man do to me? All day long they distort my words, all their thoughts are against me for evil. They attack, they lurk, they watch my steps, as they have waited to take my life. Well, David talks about how his enemies have trampled on him. And uh, they, they've distorted his words. And that, is, that could be particularly difficult. And they've waited to take his life. But he puts his trust in Elohim. He's, he's in control of those things. Now, this passage, very interesting. Because of wickedness, cast them forth. In anger, put down the peoples, O Elohim. You have taken account of my wanderings. Put my tears in your bottle. Are they not in your book? What book? Well, does it record everything we've ever done? You know, uh, first of all, let's look at the overall picture here before we look at what that is. Because of their wickedness, David wants Elohim to put them down in his anger and he acknowledges that Elohim has taken account of his wanderings. And that's what I find very interesting. Elohim knows all of his tears. He knows everything is recorded in his book. Um, in this book, Elohim's recorded everything about us. Even the number of days allotted for each of us. Look at Psalm 139, verse 16. Your eyes have seen my unformed substance. And in your book, they were all written, the days that were ordained for me, when as yet there was not one of them. Okay, how far do you take this? You know, I, 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 predestination, it's scriptural, it's a fact. 
Uh, but how far does predestination go? Do the, all your wanderings, are they predestined? No, the, the question is, is this book here they're talking about, now in, uh, in Psalm 56, verse 8, you've taken into account my wanderings, put my tears in your bottle, are they not in your book? So were they, are they, is he saying, aren't these things already written there? That's, well? That's exactly what he's saying. Well, yeah. You know, you get... You get, you get this question, okay, well, did he know I was going to scratch my head? And that Cliff was going to scratch behind his ear. And he did. And, yeah. You see, how far do you go with the predestination? I'm, I tend to agree. <coughs> uh, how many references of one, the twins in the womb and one the, before? How many uh, when John the Baptist and the Messiah that Mary and One leap, yeah. Uh, oh, Pharaoh, by the way, is going to turn you down. Uh, uh, <laughs> well, there's a, another reference here. Uh, in Malachi 3, verse 16, uh, and I wanted to include 17 and 18 there because I, I like them, but particularly verse 16, then those who feared Yahweh spoke to one another, and Yahweh gave attention and heard it, and a book of remembrance was written before him for those who fear Yahweh and who esteem his name. And they'll be mine, says the Yahweh of hosts, on the day that I prepare my own possession, and I'll spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. So you will again distinguish between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves Elohim and one who does not serve him. So in Malachi, it's called a book of remembrance, yeah. What's it say about idle words? Yeah. Yeah, they're all remembered. Are they remembered or are they kind of preordained? See, that, that's kind of my question. Well, you asked, you asked the question one time, if he knows what we're going to do, why do, does he allow to do it? Because how are we going to be judged if we don't have actions and deeds? So he knows. Well, he says that, you know, evil ones were created for destruction. I mean, that's what they were created for. So it sounds to me you're, you're proving your own question. And, and, you know, here's the thing, too. I think we want too simple of an answer to some things. We want too simple of an answer sometimes. Um, whereas I think we're looking at a much more complex situation than, than what we're asking for. You know, we'll simply, well, does that mean everything's predestined? Uh, yes, kind of, or, you know... It might be a little bit more difficult to answer than just yes or no. Yeah. Yeah. Um, everyone says this, the same thing along the lines of, well, he knows. He knows what's, uh, what has happened or he knows what's going to happen. So therefore, does he preordain it? What do you think, Sammy? Right, and he made us that way, didn't he? Yes. So then is it preordained? I know, I know. Well, once again, I think asking too simple of a question of a complex issue, you know, uh, that's, that's what I think is. But, you know, just looking at the facts, he has a book of remembrance, and apparently everything is recorded in it. I think we do... I guess have the free will to sin all we want, or is that kind of preordained too? So, uh, uh, I, once again, I think I'm, the, the, that question oversimplifies the situation. It's, it's like um, life itself. We don't even know what it is. But we want all these simple answers to explain things pertaining to it. You know, why, why are we alive? Why is our heart beating? Why is our brain functioning? Why do, the, why, do your, why do your eyes bring in 
the visual and your brain interprets it and all that. How, you, if you think about it, it's rather amazing to say I'm going to raise my left hand and it works. It's an amazing thing. <clears throat> um, yeah, there's another one here too that, and we've talked about this passage a lot, and I forgot I put it in here in this area. But Isaiah 65, the first six verses. I permitted myself to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I permitted myself to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, here am I, here am I to a nation which did not call on my name. I've spread out my hands all day long to a rebellious people who walk in a way which is not good following their own thoughts. A people who continually provoke me to my face, offering sacrifices in gardens and burning incense on bricks who sit among graves and spend the night in secret places, who eat swine's flesh and the broth of unclean meat is in their pots. You know, uh, if you ever tried to, if you heard, you've heard the reaction of people, if they find out you don't eat pork, you don't eat unclean things. It's, why? Well, in the Bible it says not to. Ha, he doesn't care what I eat. Right, well he considers that following your own thoughts, provoking him to his face. So these people who say, keep to yourself, don't come near me, for I'm holier than you, verse 5. These are smoke in my nostrils, a fire that burns all day. And then at verse 6, just notice this. Behold, it's written before me. Everything you've done, it's written down before him. I will not keep silent, but I'll repay. I'll even repay into their bosom. I always, well, I like to focus on that whole passage. It never, I never quite caught that part that it's all written down. It's all written before him. Um, any thoughts on that before we move on? Probably before we do it. Yeah, that's the thing. Is it, It's written before we do it. I'm, that's kind of the impression I'm getting. <clears throat> I've heard so many people try to explain away predestination. They just don't want to observe it. Uh, they say, uh, I remember J. Vernon McGee described it, free will uh, versus uh, election is what he called it. Free will versus election. And he said it's, it's kind of like this. Uh, there's in, in heaven, there's this door that you don't know if you want to open it or not. And when you do decide to open it, it has the time and date on the door and says, hello, Patrick, as to when that door would be open. And he said, uh, I did it out of free will, but it was predestined that I would do it and when I would do it. Uh, so I, but once again, the term free will is not even in scripture. But the free will is up here. And, and you want, it, I tend to wonder how much of that is illusion. Overrated, Overrated right. Overrated, yeah, because that's, that's kind of the prideful thing there. <clears throat> Verse 9 of Psalm 56. Then my enemies will turn back in the day when I call. This I know that Elohim is for me. And Elohim whose word I praise, and Yahweh whose word I praise, in Elohim I put my trust, I shall not be afraid. What can man do to me? Your vows are binding upon me, O Elohim. I will render thanks or thank offerings to you. For you have delivered my soul from death, indeed my feet from stumbling, so that I may walk before Elohim in the light of the living. David trusts in deliverance through Elohim. He knows that really man can't really do anything to him. And he praises Elohim for being delivered from the Philistines. <clears throat> Psalm 57, verse 1. Be gracious to me, O Elohim, be gracious to me, for my soul takes refuge in you, and in the shadow of your wings I'll take refuge until destruction passes by. This is another mictum here of David. 
The meaning of it, once again, is, is unclear. Probably refers to the psalm being a poem, being a, a covering or a prayer in time of peril for David. And it says, set to all to Sheth. Now, all to Sheth, likely a tune designation. This was uh, written concerning the time that David fled from King Saul in a cave. That's in 1 Samuel 22, the first five verses. So David departed from there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. And when his brothers and all his father's households heard of it, they went down there to him. And everyone who is in distress, everyone who is in debt, everyone who is discontented gathered to him and he became captain over them. Now there were about 400 men with him. And David went from there to Mizpah of Moab. And he said to the king of Moab, Please let my father and my mother come and stay with you until I know what Elohim will do for me. Then he left them with the king of Moab, and they stayed with him in the time that David was in the stronghold. And the prophet God said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Depart, go into the land of Judah. So David departed and went into the forest of Hereth. So that's the setting here for this psalm. Psalm 57, verses 2 through 6. I'll cry to Elohim Most High, to Elohim who accomplishes all things for me. He'll send from heaven and save me. He reproaches him who tramples upon me, Selah. Elohim will send forth his loving kindness and his truth. My soul is among lions. I must lie among those who breathe forth fire. Even the sons of men whose teeth are spears and arrows and their tongue a sharp sword. Be exalted above the heavens, O Elohim. Let your glory be above all the earth. They have prepared a net for my steps. My soul is bowed down. They dug a pit before me. They themselves have fallen in the midst of it. Selah. So David cries out to Elohim, and David entrusts Elohim to save him. His enemies have set a trap for him, his, but his enemies have fallen into their own trap, and we don't know the details of that exactly. Verses 7 through 11. My heart is steadfast, O Elohim, my heart is steadfast. I'll sing, yes, I'll sing praises. Awake, my glory, awake, harp and lyre, I will awaken the dawn. I'll give thanks to you, O Elohim, among the peoples. I will sing praises to you among the nations, for your loving kindness is great to the heavens, your truth to the clouds. Be exalted above the heavens, O Elohim, let your glory be above all the earth. So David praises and glorifies Elohim for his deliverance. Once again, it happened many times. Keep in mind, though, after David's sin, after his big problems, he was always looking over his back. Looking over his shoulder, I mean, looking behind him. In Psalm 58, verse 1, Do you indeed speak righteousness, O gods? Do you judge uprightly, O sons of men? Now, this is another mictum, a prayer for covering or deliverance. This is an imprecatory psalm. Uh, remember what a imprecatory psalm is? That's, a, that's one where you pray for vengeance on your enemies. This is against unrighteous judges. Now, there's not much worse than an unrighteous judge because they have a lot of power. Is it wrong to pray for vengeance on your enemies? No. I, I would... Uh, now, your enemies being those who uh, are against the Father and His ways right. and have wronged you personally. No, I would pray for righteous judgment. That's, uh, that's fair game. But when you pray for righteous judgment, it's a little different than saying, I wish you wipe him out, or you, you sort of set conditions of how you like the Sure, place. right. Do it your way, and if you want to involve me with it, yeah. <clears throat> Look at verses 2 through 5. No, in heart you work right unrighteousness. On earth you weigh out the violence of your hands. The wicked are estranged from the womb. Those, these who speak lies go astray from birth. They have a venom like the venom of a serpent, like a deaf cobra that stops up its ear. So it doesn't hear the voice of charmers or the, a skillful caster of spells. Uh, now David, he gives a detailed symbolic description of these unrighteous judges. 
They're estranged from the womb. They were strangers to Elohim from the very beginning is what he says. And he compares them to serpents or snakes. And even back then, they knew, by the way, you could charm snakes. Now, I don't charm them. Yelling and screaming and running away doesn't charm the snake. But there are people that uh, can make snakes be charmed or be rendered harmless. You see that a lot with cobras. And you see, he's saying, though, this charmer incantation doesn't work against these judges. They're worse than those snakes. They're like those snakes that have their ears plugged. And you can't, you can't mesmerize them and calm them. Verses 6 through 8. O Elohim, shatter their teeth in their mouth. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Yahweh. Let them flow away like water that runs off when he aims his arrows. Let them be as headless shafts. Let them be as a snail which melts as it goes along, like the miscarriages of a woman which never see the sun. Um, this, okay, here in verse 8, uh, this is one of these things where critics of Scripture, they use this as an example that the, that the Scripture is wrong. Because look, it says that snails melt away. You know, the slime that's put behind by the snail is not the snail melting away, per se. Um, but they will shrivel up in the sun. They're mostly water. And how, what's the easiest way to kill them? Salt. salt. Pour salt on them. And that just kind of soaks up the water, and then they just shrivel up, and they're dead. Uh, but, I mean, they... They leave behind a slime and they dry up in the sun. Okay, to, and then they say, well, see, they think that that, that that trail they leave behind is the snail itself melting away. Well, no, it doesn't. It's, it's, a, it's symbolic. Um, does it mean uh, that a woman who has a miscarriage never sees the sun? Does it mean that? Yeah, it never sees the sun. Well, what if it's in the daylight? See, people take this stuff too literally. It's, it's, it's a symbolic, painful description. What exactly does it mean then? It doesn't see or experience uh, life. Yeah, it doesn't experience life, but, it, but that's what it means. That's what he wants them to be like. He wants, to be like, he wants them to be like this snail that dries up in the sun. He wants them to be like that miscarriage that never came out alive. So he wants them dealt with in an extreme manner. Verse 9, before your pots can feel the fire of thorns, he'll sweep them away with a whirlwind, the green and the burning alike. The righteous will rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He'll wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. And men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely there is an Elohim who judges the earth. Here's what he says here. When... The unrighteous judge is dealt with by Elohim. David said the righteous will rejoice, and he'll wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. He said this will help men understand that there is a reward for the righteous as well as a judgment for the unrighteous, the wicked. <clears throat> Psalm 59. Deliver me from my enemies, O my Elohim. Set me securely on high away from those who rise up against me. It's another mictum, a, a, a prayer of covering in David's time of strife uh, from his enemies. Now in this case, it was when Saul sent men to David's house to watch him and kill him. But he's warned by his wife, by David is warned by his wife, who happened to also be Saul's daughter. That's in uh, 1 Samuel 19 verses 11 and 12. Then Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death in the morning. But uh, Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you do not save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be put to death. So Michael let David down through a window, and he went out and fled and, and escaped. So let's continue this psalm, verses 2 through 5. Deliver me from those who do iniquity, and save me from men of bloodshed. For behold, they set an ambush for my life. Fierce men launch an attack against me, not for my transgression, nor for my sin, O Yahweh. For no guilt of mine, they run and set themselves against me. Arouse yourself to help me and see. 
And you, O Yahweh, Elohim of hosts, the Elohim of Israel, awake to punish all the nations. Do not be gracious to any who are treacherous in iniquity. Selah. So David pleads for help from Elohim. He also prays that his grace not be bestowed on those who are treacherous in iniquity. Don't be gracious or merciful to them. That sound mean? If it was unwarranted, yes. If it was unwarranted, yeah. Yeah, if it was, if it was because people did something unintentional. Totally unwarranted. <coughs> Otherwise, no, justified. Verse 6, they'll return at evening. They howl like a dog, go around the city. Behold, they belch forth with their mouth. Swords are in their lips, for they say, who hears? But you, O Yahweh, do laugh at them. You do scoff at all the nations. Be because of his strength, I'll watch for you. For Elohim is my stronghold. My Elohim in his loving kindness will meet me. Elohim will let me look triumphantly upon my foes. So David says their particular problem are their words, what they're saying. Words are very powerful. Very powerful. Not only what we say, but uh, the printed words are very powerful. You know, uh, yeah. When he talks about the, the, the mouth and the sword, the, you know, if there's a mob and there's one person inflaming them with lies or whatever, and you lose your life, either it be stones, clubs, or a sword, you, you, you're, yep. you're, so that mouth is just like a sword when it inflames. Inflames others. That's right. That's correct. Verses 11 and 12. Do not slay them, lest my people forget. Scatter them by your power and bring them down, O Adonai. That's a term I almost forgot. O Adonai, our shield. On account of the sin of their mouth and the words of their lips, let them even be caught in their pride and on account of, their, of curses and lies which they utter. Well, David doesn't necessarily want them slain. He wants them scattered for their lies and their deceit. David wants this punishment to make the people remember the seriousness of the account of their curses and their lies. Verses 13 through 17. Destroy them in wrath. Destroy them that they may be no more, that men, they mo men that may know that Elohim rules in Jacob to the ends of the earth. Selah. And they return at evening, they howl like a dog and go around the city. They wander about for food and growl if they're not satisfied. But as for me, I shall sing of your strength. Yes, I shall joyfully sing of your loving kindness in the morning. For you have been my stronghold and a refuge in the day of my distress. O my strength, I will sing praises to you, for Elohim is my stronghold. Elohim shows me loving kindness. So he compares them, their lies and their curses, they comp he compares them to dogs who go around howling in the city. They search for food or they tell lies to others and they're never satisfied. They just go from house to house to house to house, telling their lies like a hungry, hungry dog wandering the city. And David ends the psalm with praise to the Father. Now Psalm 60 O oh, Elohim, you have rejected us. You have broken us. You have been angry. O oh, restore us. This is another mictum, another prayer of covering or protection here. Now this was written when David was fighting in the north with Aram Naharaim, which is Mesopotamia, and uh, Aram Zoba, which is between Damascus and Upper Euphrates. Now... <clears throat> Edom invaded the south and defeated, defeated Israel. Joab was sent and achieved an important victory over the Edomites. And this, this brief description in 2 Samuel makes it sound easier than it really was, but we're going to look at it at the uh, historical recollection of it. 2 Samuel 8, the first 18 verses. We read, now after this, it came about that David defeated the Philistines and, and subdued them. And David took control of the chief city from the hand of the Philistines. He defeated Moab and measured them with a line, making them lie down on the ground. And he measured two lines to put to death, one, 
full line to keep alive. And the Moabites became servants to David, bringing tribute. Then David defeated Hadadezer, the son of Rehob, king of Zobah, as he went to restore his rule at the river. And David captured from him 1,700 horsemen and 20,000 foot soldiers. And David hamstrung the chariot horses, but reserved enough of them for a hundred chariots. And when the Arameans of Damascus came to help Hadadezer, king of Zobah, David killed 22,000 Arameans. Then David put garrisons among the Arameans of Damascus, and the Arameans became servants to David, bringing tribute. And Yahweh helped David wherever he went. And David took the shields of gold, which were carried by the servants of Hadadezer, and brought them to Jerusalem. And from Beda and from Borathai, cities of Hadadezer, David took very large amounts of bronze. Now when Toi, king of Hamath, heard that David had defeated all the army of Hadadezer, Toi sent Joram his son to King David to greet him and bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and defeated him. For Hadadezer had been at war with Toi, and Joram brought with him articles of silver, of gold, and of bronze. King David also dedicated these to Yahweh, with the silver and gold that he had dedicated from all the nations which he had subdued. From Aram and Moab and the sons of Ammon and the Philistines and Amalek, and from the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. So David made a name for himself when he returned from killing 18,000 Arameans in the Valley of Salt. And he put garrisons in Edom. In all Edom he put garrisons, and all the Edomites became servants to David. And Yahweh helped David wherever he went. So David reigned over all Israel, and David administered justice and righteousness for all his people. And Joab, the son of Zeruah, was over the army, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder. And Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests. And Sariah was secretary. And Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Cherethites and the Pelethites. And David's sons were chief ministers. <coughs> okay. Now, with that being the background, Psalm 60, verses 2 through 5. You have made the land quake. You split it open, heal its breaches, for it totters. You have made your people extreme hardship. You have given us wine to drink that makes us stagger. You have given a banner to those who fear you, that it may be displayed because of the truth, Selah. That your beloved may be delivered, save with your right hand, and answer us. So David's describing the situation. Like I said, the historical account sounded pretty good. But no, it was a lot more difficult than that, defeating the 22,000 Arameans and the 18,000 whoever else, they're surrounded. They feel like there's no escape. Verses 6 and 7, Elohim has spoken in his holiness. I will exalt. I'll portion out Shechem and measure out the valley of Sukkoth. Gilead is mine and Manasseh is mine. Ephraim also is the helmet of my head. Judah is my scepter. Uh, David knows that Elohim has spoken that the one who has apportioned the land is still in control of it. All the names are parts of the land of Israel that's being described here. Verse 8, Moab is my washbowl. Over Edom I shall throw my shoe. Shout loud, O Philistia, because of me. All the other nations are put in place. Moab is a place for his dirty feet to be washed. Edom is a servant. He throws his shoes over at him. Philistia is a topic for a victory song. David and his men shortly hereafter conquered all those places, all those peoples. Verse 9, who will bring me into the besieged city? Who will lead me to Edom? Have not you yourself, O Elohim, rejected us? And will you not go forth with our armies, O Elohim? O give us help against the adversary, for deliverance by man is in vain. Through Elohim we shall do valiantly, and it is he who will tread down our adversaries. David and his men defeated their enemies. They were being attacked from all sides. And they won. And David knows only Elohim could do this. Sounded real easy reading in Samuel, didn't it? Well, he defeated these people, defeated those people, killed this many people, enslaved these guys. Well, it's, it wasn't easy. And he knows he's not the one that did it. Psalm 61. Let's look at the first four verses. Hear my cry, O Elohim, give heed to my prayer. 
From the end of the earth I call to you, when my heart is faint, lead me to the rock that is higher than I. For you have been a refuge for me, a tower of strength against the enemy. Let me dwell in your tent forever. Let me take refuge in the shelter of your wings. Selah. We don't know the predicament David's in in this psalm. He pleads for comfort that comes from the character of Elohim who does not change. For you have heard my vows, O Elohim, you have given me the inheritance of those who fear your name. You will prolong the king's life. His years will be as many generations. He will abide before Elohim forever. Appoint loving kindness and truth that they may preserve him. David appeals to the covenant that Elohim made with him. And that's in 2 Samuel 7 verse 16. May your house and your kingdom endure before me forever. Your throne shall be established forever. Verse 8 of Psalm 61, so I will sing praise to your name forever that I may pay my vows day by day. <coughs> and by the way, the only way that covenant could be made true is through a Messiah such as is described uh, in Scripture as Yeshua. It has to be that way or else how is it going to be that way forever? And the last psalm we're going to look at, Psalm 62, the first four verses. My soul waits in silence for Elohim only, for from him is my salvation. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold. I shall not be greatly shaken. How long will you assail a man that you may murder him, all of you, like a leaning wall, like a tottering fence? They have counseled only to thrust him down from his high position. They delight in falsehood. They bless with their mouth, but inwardly they curse. Selah. <clears throat> what David's doing here is contrasting himself, who trusts Elohim, with those who trust in their own wealth and devices. Got a contrast going here. He states that Elohim is his salvation. That's the Hebrew word Yeshua. Elohim's his rock and his stronghold. But others attack other men who were in high positions, and they commit murder. Instead of a rock and a stronghold, he said, they're like a, uh, a leaning wall or a teetering fence. You ever tried to climb a teetering fence? That's pretty dangerous, isn't it? <laughs> it's going the opposite direction and never cooperates with you, and you know it's coming down when you get to the top of it. Well, he says, these people like that are going to come crashing down on their own. Verses 5 through 8. My soul, wait in silence for Elohim only, for my hope is from him. He only is my rock and my salvation, my stronghold, I shall not be shaken. O, my Elo o Elohim, my salvation and my glory rest. The rock of my strength, my refuge is in Elohim. Trust in him at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before him. Elohim is a refuge before us. Selah. So David says, put your entire trust in him. Not in men, not in those guys. That's not where it's at. That's not good English. That's not where it is. Verse 9, men of low degree are only vanity, and men of rank are a lie. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than breath. You know, men of low degree and rank have no weight or substance to them. He said, these guys, you put them on a scale. And you may as well look at the scale and go, they have no substance, no weight to them. Verses 10 through 12. Do not trust in oppression. Do not vainly hope in robbery. If riches increase, do not set your part upon them. Once Elohim has spoken, twice I've heard this, that power belongs to Elohim. And loving kindness is yours, O Adonai, for you do recompense a man according to his work. David warns against trusting in the oppression and robbery of others. Don't trust in the oppression and robbery of others. Maybe, how many people do you know that kind of revel in that? It's kind of sick, isn't it? Elohim's in control in such matters. He'll righteously judge and recompense a man according to his work. So, any questions, any thoughts?
these, uh, these psalms speak a lot about what's going on, what has been going on in the mind of David as he's going through all this. <clears throat> okay, let's, uh, let's pray and we'll be dismissed. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word once again, and as always, we pray <coughs> excuse me, for your Torah to be written on our hearts and minds and that your name through that be glorified. This we pray as your humble servants. Amen. <clears throat>